Thank you very much. It's longer than um, feeling shorter than normal, but anyway. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, what I really want to talk about um, uh, in this uh, session is really the art and sort of science of medicine. I'll expand on that a bit later on, but I've also been asked to talk about how I sort of got out, escaped, if you like, uh, conventional medicine and got into uh, the sort of work that I, I do now. So I actually qualified around the corner here at UCL, and um, I had no interest in medicine, sort of therapeutics, really, because the idea of, you know, spending hours talking about sodium or potassium and tinkering with people's medication, not really getting them well, that's what I'd experienced really at medical school, it just didn't attract me. I was quite attracted by surgery, if I'm going to be fair. Um, but if I was going to reflect, at that time, I couldn't get any enthusiasm up for any of it, really. So when, it, when I uh, completed my house jobs, which, which was what F1, I think is what it's called now, was called back in that day. And I was talking to my mentor as a surgeon, and he said, what do you think of doing? And this is uh, over an nephrectomy, kidney removal. Um, I said, I'm not thinking of doing anything. Um, I said, uh, I, said I, I just can't get any enthusiasm out for anything. And his honest advice over a couple of conversations was, go then. Not, not in a, we're still friends, by the way. <laughs> he just said, go. It, it, it's, you, you're going to get very frustrated if you're doing something that you don't enjoy. And then there's a lot of politics in medicine, and we've got hardly any autonomy left now. I remember this coming up in my interviews for medical school. This is 84. And I remember being asked um, um, in one of my interviews, what do you think about the fact that we doctors have um, increasingly less autonomy and are able to make fewer and fewer decisions about how we treat our patients? That's quite a big question in 1984. And I said something like, I don't quite see it like that. And the guy that asked me the question said, I'm not asking for your opinion on it. <laughs> I'm telling you it's happening, OK? And uh, what's your point of view on it? And it's, so, you know, so this has been going on a while where doctors have felt a bit sort of disenfranchised and they don't have autonomy. And, and these are a big problem anyway. I felt a bit like that. And, um, and so what I decided to do was take some time out so to keep uh, body and soul together, I started to do some locums. And I, um, I started to do those, you know, contemplating my life and my navel mainly. And then what, I, uh, basically, what basically happened, a few months into this, I was uh, seeing some patients that were due for operations in the afternoon. So I was doing a surgical locum in a hospital up in a place called Newmarket, if anyone knows it. And uh, effectively what happened was I saw an elderly man uh, who, I think he was mid, uh, sorry, uh, early 70s, had never been in hospital before and had never been unwell. And he'd come in with an inguinal hernia from digging his allotment. And um, I just really, I liked him. And I'm quite an informal person, so I was chatting with him. And, um, and I said, well, you really never, you know, because when you clerk someone in, normally someone of that age, and it's, you know, you have to do ECGs and all sorts of stuff. And I didn't have to do anything with him. He was just perfect to go, basically. And uh, I actually at that time was suffering from a few health issues of my own. And some of you may have got into this area partly through health issues. So uh, I put on quite a lot of uh, excess baggage over my time at medical school, eating a diet mainly based on things like kebabs, kebabs and Kentucky Fried Chicken, Cronenberg 1664. That wasn't very healthy, I'll just say that. I would also had uh, lifelong eczema, uh, although despite the fact that both my parents, uh, they're now retired, but were... Um, community paediatricians. No one had ever diagnosed that until I was halfway through medical school. <laughs> and then I went to, um, <laughs> I went to, uh, t I was going to go to Thailand and I needed to get some jabs for it. And I went to the sort of, you know, the student GP surgery at UCL. And uh, it turns out that the GP had been a dermatologist. And she said, right, take off your shirt, I'm going to give you these jabs. And she looked at my chest, and it was all under my arms. And sometimes my arm would actually stick to my, like, my chest, like it was so... And I think there was fungal involvement. And that was probably related, I realise now, to the fact that from about the age of 11 or 12, I used to self-administer, sort of prescribe antibiotics from under my parents' bed for my chronic tonsillitis. And I wonder I had some fungal involvement, if you understand. Anyway, so I was in a bit of a mess. But my, my most pressing problem from a health level was the fact that I felt rubbish a lot of the time, particularly in the afternoons. Um, and I had no idea what was causing this, but it got so bad that I remember, you know, being taught supposedly in a clinic setting, you know, at UCH or somewhere. 
and you'd be sitting there and then someone would say something like, look, if I'm going to teach you, you need to do some work. So can you get up and take that patient's blood pressure or something like that? And I'd be so tired. I'd actually want to say, although I didn't, I'd actually want to say, you do it. <laughs> you know, I was knackered a lot of the time. And obviously when you start working as a, as a doctor and now your sleep is, you know, contracted for different reasons than it was when you're a student, basically I felt terrible. Anyway, as a result of this, because of this patient, I said to him, whatever you're on, I'd like some of. Because, you know, I'm a third of his age and he's got twice the well-being and I just thought, you know, I need to do something about this. So I said it rather glibly, uh, but he took me sort of at face value and he said, look, <clears throat> there's a, a few basic things uh, that I think are important. Now, this guy had been in the army, and I don't mean this at all in a disparaging way. He wasn't particularly sophisticated, you know what I mean, but he had very good ideas. And he said, look, physical exercise is important. That's why I cycle every day. My knees are slightly creaky, so I cycle. I do my, uh, eat, grew organic vegetables. But he had a very good outlook on life, I felt. And what really clinched it for me um, was that he was visited the next day after his hernia operation by his wife, <coughs> similar age, and she walked onto the ward and he got up out of the bed and I remember probably the, the analgesics have worked off a little, you know, worn off. So he gets up, he goes over to her, gives her a big hug, okay, and I'm on the ward and I'm looking at this, I'm thinking that's very nice because it's actually quite warm, it's like a proper warm embrace, not a, you know, not a British one, a proper one. <laughs> and, um, and I, so he spotted me because I'm on the other side of the ward and he turned around, so his wife's there and she can't really see me behind, but he's turned around and then he went like that. <laughs> and um, I thought, right. <laughs> the other thing he was doing, uh, it was he, was he was taking supplements as well. Now, that, that was really unheard of then. Okay. Um, and basically, he'd been listening to a radio broadcast and someone had been banging on about antioxidants. He thought, well, I'll try some of those. So anyway, um, that afternoon, after the operating list, I had to go into Newmarket Town to buy an iron because the doctor's mess one had broken and I like an iron shirt. And um, as I was, it was a sort of covered area, I remember, and I sort of went past, I think it was a Holland and Barrett, but outside there was like a carousel of books. And this conversation was still a little bit in my head and I thought, I'm gonna buy a book. I didn't have anything, as a, I was a locum, I didn't have any friends. So I thought, <laughs> I'll buy a book and I'll read that. And I started reading a book about, I can't remember exactly what it was, but as I was reading it, I was thinking, I mean, this is actually very important. You know, this made sense. It made more sense to me, honestly, in that couple of hours I was reading it than my six years of medical education, to be perfectly frank. And I thought, right, I'm going to start changing a few things. So I sort of had a hunch that maybe dairy was causing my eczema, so that sort of went for a while. And I also, I suppose, scaled my, back, my diet down to what now would be called paleo. It's basically a natural, unprocessed diet, so I took out a load of, excuse my language, crappy carbohydrates from my diet and started to eat some proper food for the first time in the whole of my life, basically. And so what happened uh, very quickly was within a week, my eczema disappeared. I mean, it just absolutely went, went, disappeared. The itching went, just everything. So I felt a lot better about that. Um, and in about six weeks, I'd, I lost a substantial amount of weight without hunger. But also within two weeks, I had all my energy back. So Ronga was talking about this earlier. And, um, you know, you feel great now. You probably feel better than you did maybe 20 years ago or something, do you know what I mean? It's not uncommon for that to happen. And so as a result of that, I was thinking, this is actually quite important. Now, it could be a massive placebo effect, but I don't know. So I think this is probably quite important, and I start reading more about it. And then I took a bit of a leap of faith, and I just started a practice, basically, doing this sort of work. And what I found very, very quickly is, exactly as Rongan said, I suddenly felt like I had some skills and some knowledge that, I, that could actually help people. And I was seeing people that had problems that I, I think as a conventionally minded doctor I had no clue about and it didn't fit the description and that's not a syndrome and blah. And then suddenly I was thinking, well this person's got a fundamental problem around blood sugar, this is food sensitivity here, this person's overgrown yeast or whatever it was. I mean it's quite simple, but you know these things are important because they're common. And so as a result of that, I basically ended up sort of specialising in the area of medicine before it really was an area of medicine if that makes sense. I mean, it's a little bit fringe now, but uh, to be perfectly frank, back then, you know, t about 25 years ago, there was nothing in this area, basically, at all. So the education had to be a bit sort of ad hoc, and I sort of went over to the States a bit and did a course here and there, and sort of got my uh, education rather piecemeal. 
I don't um, in any way regret that, but now there are structures in place for people interested in this sort of medicine so that you don't have to do that and hop around the place because you can sort of enroll on something and get all of the information that you need. So over the years, basically, I've taken, uh, I still prescribe a little bit, but very rarely, to be honest. Um, uh, so, I mean, so even when I'm, for example, treating thyroid disease, you know, I don't really look at it like I was trained to, and I don't really believe that TSH is the sole arbiter of someone's thyroid status, like some endocrinologists might. I thought it was a bit rich, actually, that uh, <laughs> when you were talking about uh, the headaches and um, there was that sort of controversy about the fact that, uh, you know, where's the evidence? And this probably came from a few neurologists. And I don't know what you know about neurology, but generally it's useless. It's a sort of diagnostic speciality, generally. Elizabeth, is that... Is that fair enough? <laughs> we I, no, we didn't confer before on this. It's a sort of, it's quite diagnostic, so they come up with a long name for something, and they oh, well, that's very clever, and blah, blah, blah. And then they can do hardly anything about it, usually, is the reality. Anyway, so let's move on uh, to talk uh, about uh, this. So essentially, um, in medicine, we've got a bit obsessed with evidence-based medicine. You may have noticed, and that didn't exist, actually, when I qualified, and it came about in about the mid 19 90s, and now everyone talks about it all of the time. Doctors absolutely believe, by the way, generally, conventionally minded doctors, that what they're doing is evidence-based, and what you might be doing or interested in doing is not evidence-based. So I'm interested to know actually whether medicine is evidence-based or not. And it's not easy to find out, but someone has bothered to actually look at this properly. And there's a, a journal called Clinical Evidence. It's a sort of offshoot of the British Medical Journal. And every so often, they review all the conventional medical therapies and see which ones have been subjected to proper trials, randomised controlled trials. And then they come up with a figure. This has been proven to be beneficial. This looks harmful. This stuff we don't know about. Anyway, does anyone here know currently what percentage of conventional medical approaches have been validated and shown to be positively beneficial? 35. 35, that's a good guess, but you're way too high. <laughs> it's about 10, it's actually 11%. It's this group here. Now, I don't think in the area that I work in, it's any better, to be perfectly frank, because you know a lot of the approaches that we may take may be informed by some sort of science or research, but have they been rigorously tested in a sort of clinical setting? No is the answer. And the question is, does it matter? Because you could argue, basically, what is um, evidence-based medicine really all about? Well, this is one of the fathers of evidence-based medicine. Uh, he died a couple of years ago, Professor David Sackett. And if you read this, his, this description, basically, that he has of evidence-based medicine, you'll notice here that the first thing that he mentions, really, is this. The practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical expertise and then goes on with the best available external clin clinical evidence. And then he goes on also to say here that basically clinical expertise means the proficiency and judgment that individual clinicians acquire through clinical experience and clinical practice. Okay? Now this is, I think, really, really important because if I sort of reflect on my practice and I'm really honest about it, I think probably a tiny fraction of what I do in clinical practice <laughs> Uh, has been validated in a way that some doctors would view as appropriate and necessary. But most people in clinical practice are not practicing medicine that has been shown to be beneficial in trials, but they have been found works very well in practice. This is important. So for example, Rongan said earlier, there's someone having 90 headaches a week, and now she has two a week. Okay, that's the sort of evidence that we would tend to find quite useful. And then you've got a bunch of neurologists going, not interested. I remember having a sort of semi-argument with a neurologist at a party once. And um, it was very interesting, actually, because he was quite normal to begin with, OK? <laughs> and then when we got onto the subject of medicine, he went very professorial. He went, mm, he's, mm, everything changed. His, his mood, his, his accent, everything changed, OK? And we, we were talking about migraine, I don't know, I mean, obviously I'm a huge wow at parties talking about migraine, but anyway. So he's, we, we somehow got talking about migraine. And uh, it's, not a, it's really not a condition, as Ronga knows, and many of you will know, that's particularly well dealt with in conventional medicine. And I said, well, there's probably approaches, this is years ago now, about 20 years ago, I said, look, there's probably approaches that you could take that might help your patients, actually. 
And he said, like what? And I said, um, <coughs> magnesium, for example. Uh, and he said, well, what's the purported mechanism of that? And I actually think I do know maybe what's going on there, but I didn't want to sort of rise to that particular base. So I said, I don't know, and why does it matter? You know, it's safe and it appears to work. And he said, well, how could you possibly use something if you don't even know the mechanism? It, this, I'm thinking, what is this? Are you actually interested in helping your patients? Or do you want to score some intellectual points? Do you see what I mean? And that's one of the problems that we have in medicine generally. It's a bit sort of intellectual, not necessarily focused on the patient. Now, here's another little um, thing that I found. This is in the British Medical Journal. This came from an orthopaedic surgeon. Um, and there'd been some sort of uh, articles on evidence-based medicine. And basically, he's saying this, you know, if I smack my thumb with a mallet, you know, it hurts. How many times do I have to do that before it's sort of evidence-based, okay? Uh, it's really two fingers up, I think, to the evidence-based medicine crowd that believes that it all has to be ratified. And the other thing I liked about this, okay, this is a typical orthopaedic surgeon, you have to declare competing interests. These are his. Uh, I like hammers and power tools. <laughs> he's just like... You lot. Anyway, I've got a lot of time for orthopaedic surgeons because one thing I've noticed clinically is it generally works. Not always, but it's generally a good thing. If someone's got a completely degenerative hip and nothing's really helping and they have that replaced and they have a whole new lease of life for 10 or 15 years, I would say that's a big success. And that's very distinct, by the way, from many aspects of medicine, including neurology. Endocrinology is another one that I've got a bit of a bugbear about, but let's not get into that <laughs> right now. So uh, here's my conclusion, really. I think medicine is more art than science, if I'm going to be frank. Um, there is a scientific element to it, and we can draw on whatever research, even in the lab, that's available. But ultimately, it's about practice. And that practice is really art-based, I think. And I think one of the important things is this, is that if you really want to be effective as a practitioner, um, you have to have good relationships with the people that you're seeking to help. It's, it's a really key thing. And this, I don't know about any of the other doctors in the room, but we were not told anything about this at medical school. Nothing about how to approach patients, how to talk to them, how to get the best out of that situation. Did anyone here have any... I realised that I was sort of, you know, trained back in the ARC days, but did, did anyone here, maybe training more recently, have any of that, did you? Not recently, but okay. I was a bit... Did you have any? Yeah, I did at St Thomas. Okay, fantastic. What did they teach you? Bedside manner. And... Oh, really? Oh, I missed that memo. OK, that's good. That's really good. That's like, anyone else? You did? OK, you're quite young. I don't want to patronise you, but, you know, that's really good. It's great that you did. OK, so here's a few things that I think that are important. First of all, um, when I think about patients, you know, obviously we're there to serve. It's a service industry, health and medicine. It really is. You're trying to serve their needs on some level. Uh, but, but actually, you get something out of it as well. So when I think about what I know, right, yeah, some of it I've been on courses and whatever, but actually what I know is essentially what my patients have told me over the years. That's really what I know. You know, what works, what doesn't work has come from basically experimenting on people and seeing what sticks and what doesn't. And so every interaction that you have with a patient is, is a two-way process, right? They get something out of it, we hope. You also get something out of it. But to make that as productive as possible for both parties, okay, we need a good relationship. So one thing that I would suggest here that's quite useful in practice is, that, and I feel like I'm teaching some of you to suck eggs here, but this is important, a bit of humility goes a long way. So don't assume any position of superiority in any way, shape or form, I would say, intellectually or anything. Just be human about it. Um, now, I read uh, an article that uh, Jeremy Hawke at um, Nutrilink sent me, and it was written by Mike Ash, who's sitting there. And it, basically the title was, correct me if I'm wrong, it was something like, are we too judgmental to be good practitioners or something like that, was that right? This is a really good article because some of us, you know, can be a bit judgmental about our patients or clients, whatever it is, how they look, how they speak, you know, the, the supposedly poor choices they've made, that's really got to go. Even if you don't say, what did you do that for? Or why are you doing this or whatever? It can leak out of you, okay? And it's not a good, you know, they need, they need to feel that they're being respected, of course, okay, and heard, and it doesn't help if we're judging. And so, you know that professorial mode that I told you about, which neurologists do all the time with their bow ties and... Yeah. <laughs> Blah. Blah. Don't get me started. Uh, that, you know, like that's going to give them a personality or something, anyway. 
It's like a, it's like a novelty tie, but anyway. So, um, so that also, it's a huge turn-off for people, okay? So just talk to them like you talk to a friend, is my advice. Um, and also, however much you know, <laughs> resist the urge to sort of overcomplicate things and sort of demonstrate your expertise and intellect, okay? Because none of that's important to people, really. And it, it usually just brings up barriers. And with regard to that, be careful with language. Because one thing at medical school, I notice this a lot, you know, we sort of develop a language and it's completely incomprehensible and gobbledygook. And even some doctors don't understand it that well, okay? And all of that basically has to go. So one of the things that I think about when I'm explaining things to patients and talking to them, I, it's almost like I'm talking to, and this is not to patronise them, I'm talking to a child, okay? The vocabulary might be slightly different, but I'm actually assuming no knowledge whatsoever. Now, even if they know that, that's fine. They're thinking, I already know this, that's okay. But don't assume any knowledge and don't be too technical. And also be brutally honest. So one of the things that we doctors can do uh, and we have a bit of a problem with sometimes is admitting that we don't know something, okay? We struggle with this a lot. Because, you know, we go through an educational system where if you're in a clinical examination, you don't know something, it's painful. And you don't want to say, I don't know. So we were often advised, I don't know what happened to other doctors here, to at least guess. Well, that's not going to work here, generally. I don't advise guessing. So I found this works very well because when an individual comes in and they say something like, like I had in my medical finals, by the way, in the obstetric case, the lady said, I've got protein C deficiency. They wheel her out every year, I suppose. I had no idea what it was, never heard of it. And so I didn't bluff it, I just said, I've, I've heard of a few things, I've never heard of that. Can you tell me about it? What do you know about it? And these days now, in practice, when I don't really know what someone is talking about, I will say to them something like, have you Googled this? What did you find out about it? Is there an autoimmune component, is it thought? But, you know, and then they can give you that information. And part of that really means encouraging them to express themselves fully, right? So that, you know, you're, you really want to be in a position where you're embracing their ideas and their preferences. This is what evidence-based medicine is about, by the way. This is even in the Dreadful Medical Council Good Practice Guide, that we should be respecting patients' preferences, okay? So there's a few sort of sentences. I don't rehearse these, okay? But these are the sort of things that I'll say during a consultation that I find really help people to open up and feel properly heard. So... Very often I'll say, look, I've got some boring stuff to do. I need to get your name and address and stuff like that. And then after that, you're going to tell me why you're here, OK? Now, for quite a long part of this consultation, you are going to be doing most of the talking, OK? I'll interrupt you, maybe. I'll ask for clarification. But you're going to be the, doing the talking, OK? What I'm signalling to them is, this is their time to be heard, and I'm all ears, OK? I don't say it in those words, but this is what that's saying. Here's another thing that I do a lot. Even if I have a fairly good idea, I think, of what's going on, and particularly if I don't, because that can happen, I ask them what they think is going on. Now, about eight times out of ten, I think, someone has a pretty good idea of what's going on, and in those situations, about nine and a half times out of ten, they're right. Because usually, you know, people have quite an innate sense, well, the people that I might see in practice, probably the same for you, they have an innate sense of what's going on, and these days, they may well have Googled it and looked at the symptoms or whatever and arrived at the diagnosis, or they might have an idea of what it is. So they say something like, I think it's something to do with my hormones, okay? Well, it probably is, is the reality. If they have that strong sense and they've Googled it a bit, then you're pro that's gold. Now, what's happened um, more latterly, I think, in medicine is, you know, uh, you know I grew up in, in an era, and I was talking to someone at dinner last night. I was actually abroad, but anyway, I was at dinner. Completely random guy. And uh, his parents are doctors. Um, and his father, who's 79, still practices as a GP three days a week. And he was saying that he basically he's a very good, he regards his father as a very good diagnostician. And I said, you know what, your father probably trained and grew up in a time, basically, when uh, there weren't that many tests available. And if you don't have your wits about you and really listen to people and look at them and examine them properly, you can't make a diagnosis. So he's probably what I would call old school. And this is a very good thing. So one adjunct to that is really to ask people what the diagnosis is, essentially, because very often they'll tell you. Um, here's another thing that I'll very often uh, ask is, you know, what is it that you're most concerned with? Because they might give you a list of 15 or 20 things that can easily happen. I've got itchy toes and my hair's falling out and whatever. And then, you know, don't make any assumptions. It's not necessarily the first thing that they said that uh, is really bothering them. So just say, what is it that's really bothering you? And then you've got a, a, a more useful starting point. 
And then this uh, question I ask almost every time, because I'll often give people a range of things that they might do to address their issues, and then I'll get them to choose what they want to do. And it might be all of it or some of it, occasionally none of it, but that doesn't really happen. You know, it's up to them. They're making the decision. You're just facilitating that. And I find that a very useful que uh, question to ask. Uh, two other things just to have in mind here, I think. There's two questions that I have at the back of my mind when I see any patient, OK? One is this. I know it's obvious. What's the best thing for this person? What do I think is going to work the best? What's going to marry with their ideals and preferences? OK, that's what I'm thinking. And the other thing I'm thinking is this. Um, how would this be explained properly? Okay, Because one thing that I've noticed about people is they tend to make quite emotional decisions, but it has to make sense, or it tends to be rejected. Okay, So I spend a lot of time in practice, because sometimes people say, how do you treat patients? I don't treat patients. I'm essentially telling them how to treat themselves, Okay, which is what functional medicine is broadly about. And so I'll, ex I'll do my best to explain it in a way that makes absolute sense. I'll ask them, do you have any questions about that? No, don't have any questions. And you've got a pretty good idea that they're going to be quite, and I don't mean this in a patronising way, compliant, that they're likely to go and do it because they feel it's the right thing, they believe in it. And the other thing about this explaining it is it's quite useful sometimes to explain your approach to other people. Like if you write to their doctor, you need to make a case very often, OK? Uh, one thing I've also found useful on doctor's letters, by the way, is uh, having this last sentence. If you haven't, so I try and explain things properly, but I appreciate not everyone's going to be receptive to it. But I say at the bottom, if you have any questions at all about this patient and his or her management, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much for listening.